Okay, how's it look a bit? And is it, is it all yep. up and ready to go? Yep, looks good to me. Cool. Okay. Let's see. Awesome. Okay. So, like I said, my name is Brigitte Martins, and I am a BCBA. I'm an associate clinician at the San Diego uh, at Trumpet Behavioral Health. Um, we are based out of Colorado, but we do provide a lot of services to clients not only in the San Diego area, but LA um, areas in Texas, Colorado, Ohio. We're kind of scattered all over the place, but I'm super excited to be here and to be talking to you guys about the selective eating. Um, during this presentation, uh, there will be a lot of topics being brought up. Um, if you have questions during and you feel like it's very important or you want it immediately um, answered, feel free to do it in the chat box. Um, if you, if it's not getting answered, you can unmute yourself and remute yourself. But I think Vitten said he would do, um, he'd be checking kind of the chat to see um, if there's any important questions coming up. Um, and if I see your question and I know we're addressing it later, I might say, oh, in a couple of slides we'll address that. Or I might answer your question right away. Um, so right off the bat, I just want to give a disclaimer as well that um, when we're looking at selective eating, oh, sorry, I'm trying to get some of these things to exit. Um, when we're looking at selective eating in general, uh, we are talking about these kind of general overviews of the topics, as well as general overviews of strategies and interventions that have been um, proven to work in uh, studies that have been done. However, a lot of the interventions we talk about will need to be modified and individualized. So when we look at these, it's not a one size fits all for every single child. Um, even if the children have similar diagnosis, even if they don't have diagnosis, it's still gonna be very individualized to that child. So with that being said, and with me um, mentioning the questions to be asked, if you do have very specific um, to your child or to one of your students, if you have very specific questions, if you could save those to the end, I'm gonna stay on for about 15 minutes um, and answer questions at the end if you have any of those really specific ones um, during, because like I said, since it's so individualized, um, everybody has, there's gonna be a lot of different questions with that. Um, so if it's a general question, feel free to ask it during. If it's very specific or you feel it's more specific, feel free to talk to me at the end, as well as there'll be um, information with my phone number and email address to contact me afterwards if you have questions. Okay, let's get started. So um, our agenda today is gonna to be looking at food selectivity as a whole, but we're gonna to look to define it. Um, we're gonna talk about its impacts, different assessment tools we use when we're looking at food selectivity. We're also gonna be looking at um, behavioral and environmental strategies that play into food selectivity, um, introducing new foods, which is always a really big one, and when to seek professional help, with, which is very, very important. Okay, so first we look to define. So when we're looking at feeding disorders, um, particularly in the population um, of people with developmental disabilities, about 89% of children with autism have some kind of feeding problem. And that might mean they have really strong preferences for certain foods. So we look at kids who might only eat white foods or only eat foods that have a really crunchy texture or if they're eating chicken nuggets, it has to be from the McDonald's box, otherwise they won't eat it. Um, it might mean a narrow range or quantity of food. It might mean every single time they're only eating five peas. They're not eating anything more than that or it's one scoop, one spoonful of this and they're done. Um, we also see a lot of increased rates of challenging behavior when presented with non-preferred food. So we'll go over this more later, but it might mean like flipping the plate, it might mean running away, it might mean tantrum and crying, engaging in aggression. Um, these are the things we, we tend to see when we're looking at um, children who have been diagnosed with autism and they're having feeding issues. Uh, chronic food refusal and selectivity is really the most common problem we see, not only with um, children with autism, but as well as um, other children as well in general. Okay, so when we're looking at defining, we kind of want to see what each of those look like. So when we look at food refusal, refusal means um, they're refusing to eat all or most foods, um, such as they're actually failing to meet caloric or nutritional needs. So this might mean that they are just flat out refusing to eat their meals. They're refusing to eat 
any foods besides a bag of chips and they're just not getting the calories they need. Um, they might be in a pretty low percentile weight wise for their age. Um, and you're struggling with that a lot. That's food refusal. When we look at selectivity, um, a selectivity is going to be when a child chooses to eat certain types or kinds of food. So this is one that we see really commonly where it's just like there's a very narrow range of what the child wants to eat. And it might be a narrow range of the type of food they want. It might be a narrow range of textures, color. We see all of those things when we're looking at um, the selectivity sides of things. Is they're eating, but they're just not eating as the types of food they should be, or there's very selected um, foods that they will engage with and eat. Okay, so we're gonna talk about what some things look like. Um, so when we're looking at, um, at food selectivity, we also wanna look at things like oral motor problems. So what an oral motor problem is, is just when there's, um, the child has an issue with chewing, um, tongue movements, lip closures or other motor, oral motor areas. So anything kind of involving the mouth um, is gonna be one of those oral motor problems. Uh, and there's dysphagia, and that's problems of swallowing. This one's very serious. This could be difficult or discomfort when swallowing, um, and it takes more time to move the food and more effort to move the food from the mouth to the stomach. So this is a potential choking hazard. Um, when we're looking at dysphagia, we're looking at working with not only a primary care physician, but we're also looking at working with um, possible speech pathologists uh, at working at these kind of motor mouth um, and swallowing issues. Um, and if these are happening, this is obviously going to be something we want to address before we start using any kind of other interventions. Okay. Feeding disorders can be caused by, for two primary reasons. Um, so we went over the definitions of some of the words we'll be using, but this is where we wanna get into kind of the reasons behind food selectivity um, or food refusal. So we look at the organic or biological side of things, and this is just the medical explanation. It just means there's a metabolic disorder. Um, there might be a food intolerance, a food allergy. Um, this might mean they don't wanna have their milk before bed because it makes their stomach hurt because they're lactose intolerant, or they tend to shy away from foods because it might make their stomach hurt, or they have some kind of gastrointestinal disorder that just makes eating, um, eating really hard for them, and they, and they can't tell you why. So that's the organic biological explanation. And then we look at the non-organic or behavioral. Uh, this is due to a history of uh, improper behavior management. So this might mean there's been a history of force feeding, um, where it's like you have to eat this and there's just kind of like shoveling food. It might involve coaxing, where it's just like constant, um, constant bribing to eat food. So they keep kind of getting things out of not eating the foods they're supposed to eat. Um, it could involve escaping from a feeding situation altogether. It just might mean when I run away from the table, I get to go watch TV and not eat, eat my food. So you're looking at escaping from these feeding situations, um, as well as there may be a punishment involved with eating um, in the past. And that could be a behavioral or, or non-organic issue that would surround uh, food selectivity or food refusal. Um, a lot of times we do see a mix where it might be a couple of things. Um, it could be a combination of, or, of organic and behavioral. Um, and that's where we work alongside with um, different clini clinicians and specialists to kind of see uh, what the best, uh, the best way to work with this specific client or child would be. Okay, so to summarize, feeding problems can become quite severe. We're looking at feeding problems not only surrounding um, behaviorally, but we're looking at it also um, medically and organically. Uh, not all feeding problems go diagnosed. So this is uh, one that happens a lot where it's just, they're just, there's a lot of food selectivity refusal and um, it's just kind of been accepted. So it goes undiagnosed by doctors. And it is co a really common, it was 89% um, with children who've been diagnosed with autism. And feeding problems are a product of combination of organic and environment, environmental -ish influences. So it's a combination of both most of the time. Okay, so one of the reasons we really wanna look at this food refusal and food selectivity is it has a lot of impacts. It doesn't just impact um, the child or the individual with the food selectivity or um, food refusal, but it also um, impacts a lot of others. So we're looking at home. Um, 
it can be time consuming. If we're looking at meal times rather than lasting for 30 to 45 minutes, we're looking at one and a half hour to two hour meal times can be time consuming to work with that. Um, it's also time consuming to make two different meals. I'm sure um, a decent amount of people who are working with children with this food selectivity and food refusal, it's making a meal for them and then making a meal for you guys and your, um, the rest of your family. So that can also be time consuming. Um, financially, it can be really straining when we're looking at very specific foods um, that are the only foods they'll eat. Um, it may not be on sale. It may be um, having to buy large quantities of that food because it's all they're eating. Um, and then family members, it can be hard when, um, when we're working with uh, the food refusal and the selectivity because it just is, it can take tolls. It can be really hard when it is having all these different influences. Um, on the home and um, those situations surrounding it. Um, same thing with school. It can be really demanding and time consuming. If we're taking rather than lunchtime lasting half an hour, it might last closer to an hour. Um, it can take up a large chunk of their day if they're in if they're in school for six hours a day and one of those hours is surrounding eating. Um, that's a that's a pretty big chunk of it. And when we're looking at social effects, we're looking at um, social acceptance as they grow older. So if eating chicken nuggets when you're three, and that's chicken nuggets that rises all you eat. Um, as you grow older, it, it's gonna be different. It's, it's gonna be um, everyone else is eating other foods and you're still just eating chicken nuggets and french fries, which are delicious, but it can have those, um, those social effects on the children. And uh, it can also isolate and restrict entire family. If there are a lot of problem behaviors surrounding eating, it can be hard to go to restaurants, so you're just stuck eating at home. It can be hard to go to family barbecues if there's only one thing that a child eats and they're just, anytime they're presented, even in proximity with a new food, there's a tantrum. It can be really hard to get out that way. Okay, so now we get to when and where to begin with assessment, some different food assessments that we work with. So the first step is we are going to determine if a problem exists. Um, this one can tend to be pretty easy, uh, depending on what your definition of a problem with eating might be. Um, but some easy ways to do this is uh, first, you just wanna look at your child's feeding behavior um, alongside and compared with uh, typical de typically developmental feeding patterns. So that means, like, let's look at their peers. Let's sit down at a lunch table with this child and five other friends. Are they eating similar lunches? Are um, when you're at a restaurant, are they looking at the kids' menu? Are they seeing multiple options to have? You're kind of comparing it and seeing, hmm, is this is this normal for this normal for my kid to um, to eat these kinds of foods? A lot paired alongside his peers. Um, we're gonna watch to see if there's poor coordination of suck, swallow, breathe response. So this just means kind of looking, um, watching your child when they eat, and see if there seems to be any kind of oral motor swallowing issue. Um, if they seem to cough really frequently or gag really frequently after they eat, um, that might be a sign of a suck, swallow, breathe um, response. Um, you wanna evaluate if food selectivity leads to nutritional deficit. So this one is um, good to do with your doctor if you're looking at um, percentiles for weight um, and they can kind of let you know like where they are in that percentile, if they're super, super low. Um, it might be something that um, you're looking at a nutritional deficit as well as um, looking up kind of caloric intake take for your child um, based on their age, height, weight. Um, you also wanna observe to see if food preferences are accompanied by emotional responses to non-referred foods. So an emotional response would be crying, whining, tantruming, pushing away, engaging in aggression, um, all of those things when a non-preferred food is presented or in their proximity. Um, next, you wanna monitor to see if there's excessive weight gain or loss. So this might just mean if you start doing a program where you want them to start eating different foods and that's all you've been presenting to them, they might, they might lose some weight. Or if there's certain foods they only eat at a certain age, it might reach the point where the metabolism is slowing down a little bit and they start gaining weight significantly. Um, lastly, is you wanna watch for signs of dehydration and malnutrition. Um, those ones are also ones you wanna to talk to your doctor about to kind of see what it looks like, um, what to watch out for, and um, yeah. 
Okay, additional signs of feeding problems. So some things you might see are really long meals. So if a meal is 30 minutes or more, if they're taking 30 minutes or more to eat their eat their food, um, that's gonna be that's gonna be a, considered a lengthy meal. Um, when you're looking at sitting down for family dinner, you might be sitting there for longer amounts of time, but um, food consumption within 30 minutes is um, kind of a, a normal baseline of a meal time. So if you're sitting there for an hour to an hour and a half, two hours, that's gonna be very, very long. And that might be a sign of a feeding problem. Um, you wanna watch out for unusual uh, and appropriate mealtime conditions. So if there's some very um, interesting contingencies surrounding mealtime, um, that might mean they're only gonna eat on the floor. They might use very specific utensils. Um, it has to be the plastic green and blue spoon. Um, or they'll only eat food that's been prepared a specific way using specific cookware. So it might mean they're watching you and they will only eat their nuggets if it comes from a kitchen microwave. Um, you also want to look at, uh, it might be a plate. They might, if their food is touching at all, that might be, if they just, every single time their food touches, they give it back to you to have, have a new one. That might be another um, common and appropriate mealtime condition. Um, even one when you're looking at um, food refusal or food selectivity, it might mean um, not being not wanting people to watch them eat because they might want to be throwing their food out. So it might mean them asking people to go away from them when they eat or eating in a secluded area. Okay. Um, so in, even more signs of feeding problems, we're looking at high levels of inappropriate behavior surrounding meals. So I kind of touched on this earlier. Tantrums, turning away or covering their mouth, swatting at the spoon or feeder, um, engaging in self-interest behavior. So this might be banging their head, banging their legs, any sort of um, any sort of injury they might cause to themselves, and gagging and vomiting. Um, this might be any time a new food with a different texture touches their mouth, they start gagging and vomiting, um, just based on the texture or even smell of the food being different. Okay, um, high levels of parental or family stress during mealtimes um, is also a sign for um, people working with the children. Uh, this might just mean you just, you just dread mealtime or mealtime might be being pushed back later because you just, the stress behind it can be really, um, can cause anxiety and can even affect you guys. And when we're looking at um, not age appropriate feeding, this just might mean eating pureed foods at the age of five. You're looking at, um, what kids their age should be eating, and if what they're eating, this kind of goes up with what we talked about earlier of comparing them alongside their peers. Is this, is this what they should be eating? Um, once again, good thing to consult with your primary care physician on. Um, next, we wanna look at impact on social life. Um, if a child can't eat outside the home, that obviously has a big impact, not only on the, on the child, but it has an impact on the family, um, and that can call, be a cause for concern. Okay, so what is the problem? Um, if anyone has a pen, if anyone has a phone, anything, even just think of it. I want you guys to think now that we've gone over all those slides on how to kind of troubleshoot a problem to find out if there is a problem, what is, what is the problem you guys have? Um, you can even share it in the chat if you guys want to, if you wanna share it amongst yourself what common problems you, you have are. You don't have to, just if you, <laughs> if you would like to. Um, Common ones I see are the white foods one. It's um, common because I only, only eat white foods. Um, or crunchy foods, it's a big texture one. I only want foods that crunch. I don't want anything squishy. Um, only drinking certain beverages out of a sippy cup or bottle. Um, using a bottle with um, like an infant bottle um, can be something that uh, might be cause for a feeding problem. Um, if your child is gagging every time they get fed, or if they have a tantrum whenever they sit down at the dinner table, those are all examples of problems that might be occurring that you guys might be seeing. So yeah, feel free to do that amongst yourself. Um, and next, we're going to look at a personal self-assessment. So this is going to be comparing and contrasting your child versus you, your student versus you. So we're looking at what does your child eat? Now let's compare to song alongside what do you eat? Um, are the patterns similar? Are they different? Um, where do they eat and where do you eat? Are we eating at the same place? Is, are we all eating on the floor, coffee table, um, by the TV? Kind of what does that look like um, when you're comparing it against each other? Um, when does my child eat? When do I eat? 
is it a situation where the child seems to be grazing all day and they're not hungry at dinner and then you have your three meals a day or are you grazing around as well? Um, and then who does my child eat with and who do I eat with? Is it that there's a lot of stress around the eating time and meal time that you just, you don't even get to eat dinner with them and you're eating dinner afterwards just because you, you're working so hard on getting them, getting them a meal and getting them to eat and engage with their food. Um, these are all just things to like to look at because like I, we talked about before, um, modeling is a big one, kind of seeing what the people, um, not only you, but their siblings are doing around them. What are they doing versus what am I doing? Um, modeling can be a great way to work on food selectivity and food refusal. Um, and this just brings awareness to kind of our own behavior, um, as, um, people who work with these children. Next, we're going to talk about medical assessment. So this is a really, really important slide. Medical assessment is a must. There should not be an intervention at all until there's a consultation with a medical ex expert. Um, I do a lot of these feeding assessments, feeding programs, and every single time, even if the parent's like, nope, I, they're just being picky, I know what it is, I, without a doubt, I always say, go talk to your primary care physician. Um, we always want to rule out biological or physiological factors. Um, this means go check out with a, a gastroenterology GI doctor, gastroenterologist. Uh, gastro um, you might want to talk to your general physician, uh, a licensed speech pathologist. These are all um, different specialties that are able to look and rule out biological or physiological factors. Um, you can also consult with a dentist. There might be um, TMJ, that, which is just like a locked jaw where they have issue with chewing um, harder foods, might be hard, they might get um, pain in their jaw. Uh, cavities, cavities can be really painful. Molars, wisdom teeth, all that stuff can be um, biological or physiological factors affecting food refusal or food selectivity. Um, there's also a test called the barium swallow test, which is conducted by a licensed speech pathologist. Um, this ensures safety. Um, it's essential if texture is a concern, and it's really important when we're looking at food pocketing. Um, so a lot of times if we're looking at having a, um, a child engage with some different foods um, and they don't enjoy it or there's some kind of texture wears them out, they might put it in their mouth and just keep pocketing it in their, in their cheeks. And what this can be a really big choking hazard because as you know, when you fill up your mouth, there comes a point where your mouth is too full and it starts going towards the back. Um, so the barium swallow test is um, one to look at um, the, the, the swallowing in general and the speech pathologist would be able to run that test. Okay, once again, once again, in case you weren't sure, um, it's necessary. You really want to make sure you consult, even if it's just with your with your primary care physician. You want to make sure they're in they're in on this. Um, just let even just letting them know. Hey, by the way, this has been an issue. I know we've talked about it. I'm working with a BCBI or I'm working with an SLP, and this is what we're doing, just to keep them in a loop. So, if a medical issue does arise, they're not. It doesn't seem like it's out of the dark, and they're kind of on the team with you guys. Okay, so readiness is the third step. And when we say readiness, we don't, we don't really mean um, readiness of the child. We're looking at, are you ready? Are you the parent ready? Are you the teacher ready? Are you the therapist ready? Um, it can be really time consuming. Um, the more caregivers present, the better, especially if there's siblings or other children involved, like who's gonna be working or feeding um, or watching the other children while you're spending this one-on-one -on -one time working with this child on this program. Um, so if it's a situation where there might not be um, opportunity for that, are you ready to commit this amount of, a, a significant amount of time to this, um, to this feeding program? Um, it's difficult, it can be really frustrating, and I'm sure there's a lot of built-up frustration already with just trying to work with this food refusal and um, food selectivity, but it's difficult, it's frustrating, emotional, you're feeling all these feelings, it's, taking up a chunk of your time, it might not be successful right away, it might not be successful at all, and you even might need to take other steps. Um, but if you're not ready, it can actually be worse if you try. So if you're not if you're not checking these boxes off and being like, I'm ready to do this, I have the time, I know it's gonna be hard, but I have a support system, it might be worse if you end up trying and failing at it, because then there might be even a greater history of all these problems surrounding um, feeding and food refusal. So if you just keep building up a negative history be behind eating and trying different foods, um, it can end up being more, more, more hurt than it is good. 
So we want to make sure that you guys are ready. And that's something that only you can decide. We can't tell you, oh, I think you're ready or you're not ready. That's for you. Um, step four is going to be setting goals. Um, so we want to make sure we operationally define these goals. And that's just a fancy way of saying we want to make sure it's observable, measurable, and specific. And what we mean by that is it's not like, oh, I want Sally to eat vegetables. That's very broad. Are we saying licking a piece of broccoli is eating a vegetable? Are we saying having an entire plate of broccoli is um, eating vegetables? Are we saying we only want her eating broccoli or do we want more vegetables? So that's kind of a vague definition. We want ours to be op um, operationally defined. So we want it to be very specific um, and easy for everybody to understand. So if grandma comes over and is feeding the kids dinner, if you say, okay, this is my this is my goal. This is the goal for Sally eating. Is she gonna be gonna be able to understand what that means? So if you say eating vegetables, grandma might mean oh one piece of broccoli, then she gets ice cream. Whereas you are saying I want at least five pieces of broccoli eaten with a fork to get ice cream. Um, so some examples of this are we want to increase her liquid or uh, uh, increase her liquid intake to eight ten ounces per day. It's not drinking more water. It's ten ounces per day. It's measurable. It's observable. It's specific. Um, eat at the dinner table for every meal. So that one is easy to check off the box. Are they at the table or are they not at the table? Um, reliably eat three new vegetables without protest. So it's not just, oh, they'll eat vegetables, it's three new ones, and they also won't be protesting or tantruming during it. Um, engage in no problem behavior for five consecutive days. Uh, so these are all examples of what you might write as a goal. Um, but with this, we just want to make sure, I want to add in that we want to make sure these goals are realistic. If um, if you're looking at a, a kid who has never eaten a vegetable in their entire life, three new vegetables within a given time might be too many. It might be looking at one vegetable. If we're looking at um, a kid who engages in problem behaviors every single time there's a meal, no problem behavior for five consecutive days might be a lot. We might be looking more at two consecutive days or having only one instance of problem behavior. You know your kid and you know the students you're working with. Um, make sure you look at this and make it realistic. We can always change and upgrade the goals. Um, so if, if, if Sally's doing a great job with her liquid intake of 10 ounces per day, we might be like, okay, let's up it to 15. She's doing a great job. She's had this intake for five days in a row. Let's make it a little bit more. We can always change them as they start mastering them. Um, but yeah, make it realistic. Um, you want to make sure you're setting not only yourself up for success, but the child up for success. Step five is gonna be getting to work. Um, so we wanna establish a meal and snack schedule. This just means that we wanna create some sort of consistency in their day for eating habits. Um, this, is especially, this is especially good for um, children who graze a lot, where it's like, I don't know why they're not eating and they're not hungry, and it's because they're snacking all day. Um, having a daily schedule, kind of, this is an example, schedule, meal time, snack time, so breakfast, snack, wake up time, bedtime, nap time, play times, you're just kind of making a schedule that you know when it's when they're having food and when they're not having food. Um, this helps not only them understand when it's time to eat, but it also helps you maintain a schedule of when it's time to eat um, for them. Consistency goes a long way. Um, so if a child can expect the same thing each day with like obvious, obvious exceptions of like birthday parties or weekend outings or long car rides, um, if they can expect the same thing every day, they're going to get into the, the schedule of it, the habit of it, and it's going to just, they're not going to be uh, looking to graze as much because they're more used to having a consistent snack schedule. Um, with that being said, grazing and snacking aren't the same thing. Scheduled snack times, we're not saying don't eat ever between meals, but we're considering snack time a meal. So as you hear to me referred as, I keep saying, I will keep saying don't eat between meals. Snack time is a meal. <laughs> it's not, I'm not saying cut out snack time completely. Um, but yeah. Consistency is great when we're looking at these um, selectivity and refusals. Okay, so like I said, setting up times for meals and snacks, um, spread it out evenly throughout the day. So typically we're looking at three meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner with two to three snacks. It might mean breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner, dessert, or even if there's no dessert at the end, it's just two to three snacks throughout the day um, is the schedule which we look to kind of make. Um, eliminate eating between meals. So this will mean um, eliminating the grazing. So if it's not snack time, if it's not meal time, we're not going to be eating and there's no access to food. Um, 
they'll learn avoidance at mealtimes is okay. Um, we don't want them to, oh, sorry. We don't want them to learn that avoidance at mealtime is okay. That they'll get what they want later. So this is why it's okay. We're having mealtime right now. After mealtime, if we don't eat, we're not gonna go to the cabinet and get some, uh, some Cheez-Its. We're not gonna go to the fridge and grab a cheese stick. We're gonna eat this meal. This is your option. Then we'll, the next, when the next meal time comes, you'll have another opportunity to eat. Um, whether that's refusing breakfast and having a snack after, a snack in an hour or two. Um, we just want to make sure that it's not like, okay, I refuse my food and then I get the food I actually prefer right afterwards. Um, and if they're eating between meals, they're not likely to be motivated to try new foods if they're not hungry. So we want to make sure that when we're using this protocol, that they're we're not starving them, but we want them to be hungry. We want them to be interested in this in this new food in a way that they wouldn't be if they were feeling full or satiated on a snack they had just had. Okay, so limit liquid intake between meals and snack. So liquids are always good. Water is best, obviously. Um, avoiding sugary drinks like Gatorade juice. Um, all of those things, milk and juice and other drinks with calories can limit appetite. So if they're having a glass of milk in between snack and lunch, their hunger during lunchtime is probably gonna be a little bit less. They're gonna be a little bit more full off that milk. Um, juice or milk at meals and snacks. So obviously it's dependent on their age, what um, they could be drinking and eating. You wanna make sure you're consulting with your primary care physician on how much they should be drinking as well as what they should be drinking. Like I said before, water is best. Water hydrates you without filling you up a ton because it doesn't have those extra calories. Um, and we're looking at a typical preschooler um, with a five ounce um, liquid intake at each meal. So if you're looking at having three meals and two snacks, that'd be 20 ounces a day um, at the meal times. And liquids can always be a great motivator um, if we're looking at um, if we're looking at using liquids during meal times. It might be have a bite, take a drink, have a bite, take a drink. It's also a really great way to target pocketing. I know I mentioned food pocketing before. If we're looking at a kiddo who likes, well, if you're making them eat broccoli broccoli, 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 they're not swallowing it. It's just sitting in their mouth. You might have a preferred beverage next to them. Okay, time to take a drink. And with that drink, they'll naturally just start swallowing what's in their mouth. Um, doesn't always work, but it's always great to have in your back pocket if you are working with the behavior of pocketing. Okay. These slides are all clicky. Okay, so we also want to decide what to present at meals. So where to start depends on history. Um, so the first thing to do is start with consistent snacks. Are we doing targeting snacks? Are we targeting apples and pretzels rather than fruit snacks and chips? Are we looking at changing those things out and creating consistent snacks throughout the day? Um, when we're looking at introducing new foods, we definitely want to start with small bites presented with familiar foods. So we don't want to just hand them a heaping bowl of big stems of broccoli we want to make sure we chop it up a little bit smaller or we might present it next to something more preferred like mashed potatoes where we're able to see both of them alongside each other um, and it's presented with the familiar foods. Um, we want to avoid presenting all new or non-preferred foods at once. So if we're targeting vegetables, I'm not just going to hand over a plate of carrots, peas, broccoli, and just giving it to them, like, go to town. Um, we want to make sure we're kind of starting slow and not preventing, presenting a whole bunch of non-preferreds at once because that might cause um, behaviors or tantrums or uh, even more avoidance. Um, and when we start, we want to make sure we're only requiring kind of, this is, goes along with being realistic, we're only requiring one to two bites at first. We don't want to say finish your plate or you're not getting TV after dinner. We want to look at, okay, this is something new. We're going to keep it positive. We want them to access the reinforcement of engaging with the food from the start. Um, so we're looking at the reinforcement if we're saying, okay, when you eat your food, you get to watch a movie after dinner. Awesome. Great. At first, it might be one to two bites to access the movie. And then as they start engaging more and more, you start upping it. Okay, now it's five bites to get the movie. Now it's 10 bites to get the movie. Now you have to finish your plate to get the movie. You wanna start small and work our way up. So rather, so rather than having tantrums help them avoid the food, they realize it's super easy to take two bites and then be done. Okay, two bites wasn't that bad. Then I work up to five bites. Five bites is not that bad. We just keep working it up. And that tends to create um, not only a history of like, 
positive reinforcements for surrounding these meals. Um, but it also helps them it builds a trust that okay if i if i actually eat this i will access that sometimes the history can be oh i've eaten these things i was promised this and it never happened or i had broccoli i was told i'll get ice cream ice cream never came so we want to kind of create this positive history um surrounding these these eating and engaging with new foods um and yeah realistic expectations so if we're looking at a child who is just every single time they see um, they see broccoli or they see meat, they just throw it. It's done. It might just mean, okay, we're going to start with allowing meat to be on the table for one minute. Then they get to leave. Meat's on the table for two minutes. Then they get to leave. They have to touch the meat. So even starting that small is sometimes what we have to do when we're working with a really strong learning history of food refusal or um, food selectivity. Um, even allowing it onto the table with the rest of their food might be really hard for them. So we want to start and meet them where they're at. Okay, so we wanna establish how long meals will be. So we went over this a little bit earlier, but 20 to 30 minutes per meal is pretty average on how long it should be taking um, a child to be eating. Um, 10 to 15 for a snack is a little bit shorter, but if it's, if it's a bag of pretzels, it should only take 10 to 15 minutes. Um, we wanna make sure we're using a timer to indicate when meals are over. So that's really important. And um, there's something we do a lot, we call it priming. It just means also giving like warnings when it's gonna be over, okay? I see you still have your broccoli on your plate. You've got 10 more minutes to eat broccoli. Then the meal time's all done. Okay, you've got five more minutes left. So you're letting them know timer's about to go off rather than the timer just being a strong end, like sitting there. Their concept of time is obviously not a little bit different than ours. So they might ha not have a concept of how long they have to eat. So providing them a lot of reminders towards the end or they'll be yeah, towards the end of the eating time. Um, will be really helpful to kind of prepare them for when the time is going to go off um, for whatever their consequences might be. Um, when meals are done, when the timer goes off, um, or when food is consumed. So this might be, um, you might do either or, where if we're working on eating two bites of broccoli, it might mean, okay, we're going to sit here until the two bites, bites of broccoli are done, um, and then we get to get up. So it could be a little bit different that way as well. Um, without grazing between meals and snacks, um, we'll actually have increased motivation. So that just means that they'll be hungry. They're not starving, but they'll be a lot more hungry if you're presenting them with this dinner time meal and they didn't have um, an entire apple an hour beforehand. Because even though apples are healthy and great, it might make them less likely to engage with this different food we're presenting at, um, at dinner time. And once again, set clear goals and expectations um, based on what you have planned out. So when we're looking at behavioral environmental strategies, um, we wanna make sure we're using a strategy where we don't ask. If it's not a question, don't ask. Um, a lot of times they say, oh, can you take a bite? And they say, nope. And it's like, okay, you can't take a bite. You told me, you answered my question. Um, whereas if we say, okay, take a bite, it's more of a clear, a clear statement, a clear demand, and we're providing an expectation for them. Um, if we ask them a question, we're not really setting an expectation. We're asking them if it's a possibility they might be able to do this. Um, but if we state a demand, then they understand what the expectation is for them to either access reinforcement or um, just what you're, what you're expecting of them. Um, so don't ask the question. Another thing is don't repeat instructions. Give them time to respond. If this is a child who has engaged in refusal with broccoli before and you say okay go ahead and eat your broccoli and they're not eating it a they, they probably understand what you're they understand the demand the broccoli is in front of them they know this is what they normally eat and they're refusing to eat it um so you don't need necessarily need to repeat it they just might need a time to respond to it um and the more instructions given the more they don't respond the less they will listen um i know this is um commonly heard in a bunch of different behavioral um, behavioral terms, but if you're looking at presenting a demand, if I say, okay, sit down, sit down, sit down, and none of those times I'm saying sit down, the child is sitting down, it's just letting them know when I sit, so when I say sit down, it doesn't actually mean sit down. You can do whatever you'd like to do. I'm just gonna keep saying sit down, sit down, sit down. Whereas if you present it one time and they follow it, then you're they're not only they're accessing that reinforcement, but you're also not creating a history of when I say something, it doesn't really mean anything. 
Okay, so when we're looking at providing attention, we want to provide it contingently. Contingently is just a really fancy way of saying, based on the behavior they're displaying, this is what we're going to do. Um, so if behavior A happens, this is what's happening. If behavior B happens, this is what's happening. Um, so the first rule is ignore inappropriate behavior. So that means crying, whining, complaining, negotiating, gagging. All these behaviors are things we want to um, we want to look to ignore. And at the bottom it says gagging. Um, it may be like we talked about going to see a doctor before. If gagging is a medical issue, that is obviously um, something a little bit different. But at this point in time, we're assuming the gagging might be behavioral, where they're engaging in gagging just to avoid having the food. Um, so that's just a disclaimer there. Um, and when we're looking at ignoring, we don't necessarily want to we don't want to sit there and ignore if the child is sitting there making a mess and throwing food all over the place. We can ignore by pushing the food away a little bit, making sure they don't have access to it. Um, whining and crying, it means not negotiating. Okay, come on, just eat this broccoli, please. This bro we'll be done as soon as you eat this broccoli. It can be really tempting to engage in that because you're, it's just, you're, you just know they just, just one bite and they're all done, but not engaging in that kind of negotiating um, is, is really important. So we wanna ignore those behaviors and any other inappropriate behaviors you might think that your child is engaging in. Um, I know before we mentioned engaging in SIB behaviors, that's not written here because that's not one you want to ignore per se. Um, there's various strategic ways to ignore um, SIBs. It might mean blocking without providing any verbalization. So it might mean you're blocking them from hitting themselves or hitting themselves against something else. Um, but you might be, not be talking to them, but that's something very specific to the child. And we don't wanna say, ignore that because we want that to be assessed um, a lot more in depth. Um, when we're providing attention contingently, we also want to make sure we're praising appropriate behaviors. That doesn't necessarily mean praising eating. Obviously, we want to praise for them taking bites and engaging with the food, but it's things like using napkins, using utensils, sitting appropriately. You can praise any of these behaviors surrounding mealtime. Um, it might mean praising them looking at the food. It might mean praising them touching it. Depending on the level we're at, we want to make sure we're just providing a ton of reinforcement behind engaging in appropriate behavior surrounding mealtime. So if I'm sitting there and I presented with, um, with, with grilled chicken and they're just not having it, I love how you're sitting so nicely. I love how calm your body is. Nice job touching the chicken. That was, so, that was such a good job. I love it. You're doing awesome at the table right now. I love sitting with you. Any, any of these praises, um, we wanna make sure it's behavior specific. So not just like, good job, good job, good job. Um, you wanna make sure we're making, labeling what they're doing and saying why it's great they're doing it to let them know that, um, that there is a lot of praise and positivity surrounding this. Um, in the beginning, we talked about sometimes um, kids that are learning history of punishment or just negative experiences surrounding these, this, this this eating in general, and that can be a cause for food refusal. We want to make sure we're breaking that and we're saying this is a good time. This is a time where you're able to access the things you want to access. These foods are good for you. We want to make sure we're making it positive. Um, and the more positive we make it, um, the more likely they are to engage with us as well as with the foods. Okay, model behaviors you want to say. We talked about this before, and this is really why I kind of had you guys do that self-assessment of seeing, okay, what is my kitty? What do I eat? When do I eat? When do they eat? Um, modeling behaviors you want to see is super important um, for any any child. They do they engage in a lot of observational learning. So just learning by watching others. So watching what you do and seeing, oh, I see what they're doing. Let me see, let me only try to do the same thing. Children can learn what and how to eat by watching their peers as well as models. U.S. parents, U.S. teachers, U.S. therapists, all models, um, all, all people who are um, who they're watching constantly. Um, studies show a child's fruit and vegetable intake is often related to a parent, sibling's, peer's intake. So if you're eating a lot of vegetables, there might be a possibility that they're gonna see that and be like, oh, this is cool to eat. This is what I wanna eat. I wanna eat what mom's eating. I wanna eat what dad's eating. I wanna eat what older sister's eating. Getting everybody involved in this um, can be a lot of work. I know that everyone's vegetable intake or food preferences may be different, um, but when we're looking at this positive modeling, we wanna make sure that kind of everyone's on board and they're getting this all this positivity surrounding what they're eating as well. 
Um, so we're looking at creating mealtime habits. This means we might want to look at minimizing distractions. Mealtimes take a lot longer when you're watching TV. Um, and I know this, like, when you're sitting in front of the TV, when you're using the phone, I take a lot longer to eat when I'm distracted. Um, so if we're looking at creating good habits um, for these children who are engaging this refusal and um, and selectivity, minimizing the, like, the distractions in the background, whether it's TV, phone use, tablet use, whatever it might be, um, even some distractions might be if they're eating by themselves and siblings are off playing. That's also distracting. Um, so creating the, the minimiza minimizing all those distractions surrounding it. Um, seating in a particular format area, this just might mean sitting at the table or if we're working with a kiddo who only will eat on the floor, maybe having a special mat they have to eat on. Even though we're not getting to the table yet, we have this special mat where they're not just eating anywhere on the floor. Um, they're able to kind of engage with it in a more controlled way and we can work our way up to getting them to the table. Um, looking at adaptive equipment, they make a lot of this good stuff, um, whether it's weighted spoons or forks. Um, there might be mats under the plates to prevent the plate from slipping around. Um, they even have adaptive plates where if there's an issue of food touching, get one of those fun little plates that have the dividers um, and use one of those. Um, even adaptive chairs, if it's kitchen, if the kitchen table is a little bit too high for them, getting an extra seat, extra cushion, something to make it easier for them to reach the table and be up there with the rest of the family. Um, these are all things you can consult with occupational therapists on. I'll talk about occupational therapists a little bit later, but, um, but, it's a, but they're really helpful with this adaptive equipment if it's needed. Okay, um, when looking at introducing new foods, we wanna make sure we're adding tiny pieces um, so it can be easily mixed in. So it might mean chopping up strawberries and putting them in applesauce or yogurt. And then we can increase the size as well as the amount of pieces um, in this, in the food they're eating. Um, and we can decrease the amount of preferred food. So if we're looking at strawberries and yogurt, it might mean slowly adding chopped strawberries and then de and two tablespoons of yogurt. Then you start adding one tablespoon of yogurt and more strawberries. So they're just engaging with the strawberries um, more so than the yogurt. So more examples, um, apples also fruit, grilled cheese with meats, chop up chicken really tiny and put it in with their grilled cheese, um, and juice with water. Um, a critical factor in this is make sure you, we call it fading of, of non-preferred food. So this... Sorry, okay. sorry. Um, we got a question. So uh, it says seven steps for earning instructional control can be used in feeding training and then as a substitute for escape extinction. Was that, sorry, was it a question or a statement? The, I think it was a question. Was it asking if the seven steps of instructional control could be used? Uh, yes, I think so. Okay, a seven steps of instructional control is Awesome, is an awesome tool to use for anything you're trying to do. Um, it is a great way to develop that instruction control at the table. Um, if there are a lot of those refusal and selectivity behaviors where they're not engaging at the table or they're very particular what they eat, um, gaining instructional control as a parent or a teacher um, is really helpful at that. So I ho hopefully that answers it. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a great tool to use. It's okay. I could, do, I could do a whole other PowerPoint on, this, on, on that. Um, but yeah, if you're familiar with that, it's a, this is a great, um, great thing to pair it with if we're looking at, because the more instructional control, um, the more likely they are to, A, trust that they're actually going to gain reinforcement. Um, escape distinction um, is, it's very particular like I said, very particular to the actual child we're working with um, because we are working with children who might have very strong histories of um, negative reinforcement, punishment surrounding eating. We wanna be careful that we're not creating um, an even longer learning history of, um, of problem behavior surrounding that. So escape exemption is an option, but that's something very, like I said, very specific to the child and their learning history. We wanna make sure we're not using escape extinction every single time. Um, and we also wanna make sure that's a very important one that you wanna consult with a PCP or a doctor about because if we're using escape extinction for a child who's got any type of medical or um, uh, organic issue surrounding eating, um, that can be, um, that's, a very, that's a very serious form of punishment. So you wanna make sure we're not doing that as well. So yeah, um, that, was a good, that was a good question. Did I, I hope I answered that. <laughs> 
Okay. Um, so, okay, so back to fading. So fading is just looking at, if we're looking at increasing water and decreasing juice, we're gonna start out with maybe 75% juice, 25% water. As time goes on, we might switch it to 60-40, then we might make it 50-50, and then it might be 25% juice with 75% water. So we're slowly fading it. We're not just giving them half and half because a lot of times they'll be able to taste the difference. So we want to kind of make a slow fade to that. Okay, options other than mixing. So we can do simultaneous pairing, which just means we might be doing meat with cheese and might be introducing chicken into mac and cheese or um, starting with a large amount of preferred food and a small amount of non-preferred food. So we've got a big heating pile of mashed potatoes and two pieces of broccoli. And eventually we'll have three pieces of broccoli and a little bit less potatoes. And we just kind of start changing it a little bit. Um, using preferred sauce is a good one. Um, barbecue sauce, the chicken, ketchup, ranch, all of that stuff is a good way to start kind of pairing um, different foods um, and make it more enjoyable for them. Um, sequential pairing might just mean first present small amount of new food and then immediately follow it by preferred food. So one bite broccoli, okay, here's some mashed potatoes, awesome job. Um, we want to we want to look at reintroducing um, previously eaten food. So a lot of times it's like, well, when they were when they were a baby or an infant, they were eating carrots all the time, and then they just stopped. Or they were eating fruit, and then they just didn't want anything to do with fruit. Um, so when we look at um, running these programs, we want to look at what they used to eat first, because they already have a history of eating this food. Um, we know they've eaten in the past and haven't had behavior surrounding it, so um, we want to look at those to maybe start with those. Uh, we also want to consider why they stopped eating it, so that'll be when we kind of look back and are like, hmm, what kind of, what's the, what's the button that clicked when they stopped eating this, the food they used to engage with? Um, motivating your child. So grandma's rule, um, the fancy term for this is pre-mac principle, and it just means that you can't do something you want until you do what you don't want to do. So first eat the broccoli, then you have a, a spoonful of yogurt. First have some water, and then afterwards we can have some juice. Uh, any of these, we want to do first non-preferred item and then preferred item. Um, we use things called first then boards, which is super easy to make yourself. It might just mean you write first, have a picture of the broccoli, then have a picture of the chip, or even write it out if you're if your learner's a reader, and just present it so they actually have the visual of this is what I have to do first, and then this happened after. Um, preferred food is only given, when you're using this, you want to make sure preferred food is only given when they eat in the non-preferred food or touched it. Whatever your requirement um, or expectation is of them, if it's to touch the chicken, then they get to access popcorn, or if it's just to put the pea in their mouth and they can spit it back out, they can access whatever they need. So whatever the expectation is, first they have to do what the expectation is, and then they get the non-preferred food. Um, and you wanna, stick, you wanna stick by that, because if you start being lenient with that, and it's like, oh, okay, well you didn't eat it, here's this food anyway, they just keep learning, oh, if I don't engage with this food, I'm still gonna get what I want. It just might take longer. Is it a question? Sorry, is it, is it a question? Okay. Um, okay, moving on. Um, move, move to meal portion and then dessert. So in dessert isn't happening um, during, it might be happening afterwards, they might have to earn it. Um, this is a very common thing. I'm sure a lot of people have had the grandma's rule of first you eat your dinner, then you get your cookie. Okay, we're looking at um, rewarding, um, providing reinforcement for engaging with these different or new foods. Um, if we're using food, we don't wanna use foods that are used in meals and snacks. If, we're, if during snack time they get access to fruit snacks, it's not gonna be super rewarding for them to get fruit snacks at dinner time when they eat their broccoli because they are like, well, I'll get it tomorrow during snack anyway. Um, use foods that they don't get, like ice cream. I know ice cream is a really big, is a really big one. If they're not used to getting ice cream for snacks, Save it for meal time, okay? Broccoli, then you get ice cream afterwards. It turns into a special treat. Um, and a special treat can even be things they're used to they're used to eating. If you know that flaming hot Cheetos are their absolute favorite, it might just mean fading out flaming hot Cheetos from snack time and they only get them when they engage in those particular um, food. Um, toys, watching their favorite video, continuous access of taking bites. So um, sometimes when we're looking when we're looking at reinforcing, it might mean they have the tablet out and they get to watch videos as long as they're eating that new food. As soon as they stop eating it, it's paused. 
then they start engaging with it again and they get to have access again. So that kind of is contingent access based on whether or not they're engaging with those different foods. Okay, when to seek professional help. This is really important um, because if, what if it's not enough? What if it's not working? Um, feeding problems can be too severe and you gotta know when you need extra help. Um, if, under, if, if your child is severely underweight and you're realizing it's just not changing no matter what you do for a certain amount of time, um, it might mean they feel like they're malnourished. They're just not getting certain vitamins you know they need or their doctor has said they need to start, um, start eating. Um, severe problem behavior. So this is what I talked about earlier with the SIBs. Um, that would be considered a severe problem behavior where they're actually hurting themselves or even ones where they're engaging in aggression and really hurting others. You wanna make sure you're getting help. Um, motor deficits is the other one we talked about. Um, you wanna make sure if there is a swallowing issue or a chewing issue, we're addressing it with um, multiple providers in multiple ways. Um, so behavioral intervention. So ask your BCBA for assistance for referrals. So if you have a BCBA or um, a clinician you're working with, they can help you with referrals. You might need a speech pathologist. You might need an. Um, you might need to go to a gastroenterologist. You might need to see an occupational therapist. Any of these things you'd be speaking help with. Um, if it's severe, there actually um, are programs where you can do pediatric feeding disorder programs. Um, I know Ratings has one. I, I'm not sure if um, the SDSU has one, but it just means that it might be um, an intensive day treatment or an outpatient one where it just is very. Um, it's focus entirely around their eating. Um, it's focused on feeding specific, specifically, and it takes a multidisciplinary approach. So you're working with a team of behavioral, OT, speech, all in one place, all in one day to target this um, for these feeding programs. Um, biggest thing is talk to your medical professional, talk to your doctor, talk to um, their pediatrician, and any of that, um, they'll be able to help you through that process as well. Um, other providers, so I've mentioned ad nauseum, speech pathologists as well as occupational therapists. Um, speech, speech pathologists help with kind of the motor movement of the mouth as well as swallowing. So they're looking at those things um, where they're working at like making um, oral motor movements. Occupational therapists do a lot of texture stuff. So if it happens to be a texture issue they're working with, it might mean consulting with the occupational therapist on a desensitization training, um, which just might mean exposing them to these different textures um, in a way that provides reinforcement, but you're also kind of normalizing those textures. Um, they also help with the adaptive equipment, like the if there's an issue spearing or they're just using their hands to eat, the occupational therapists can work with them on improving um, fine motor movements as well. Um, coordination of care is critical. It's great to have um, BCBAs or clinicians who are like, let's do this. But understanding that there's different specialties and having everybody talking and everybody on the same page is super important because you don't want something being done at speech and then it's not happening at home or not happening during ABA therapy or the OT is doing something different. You want to make sure everyone's talking so that um, the care for your child is just, is just being done um, with transparency as best as possible. Okay, so these are um, behaviorally based assessments. So this would be done by BCBAs um, or behavioral clinicians. So we're looking at the FAMBI, which is just feeding and mealtime behavior interview, um, the PMAS, the BAMBIC. All of these are just interview type questionnaires where we go with you, go through it with you, and we kind of start figuring out the function and um, learning history as well as um, what foods they do engage with, what they don't engage with. So we kind of help you in the beginning. We're like, what's the problem? We're kind of helping you figure out why the problem. Um, so we're looking at why the problem, we want to see, okay, is it because of a texture? Is it because they like the attention of surrounding mealtime and maladaptive behavior? Is it because they only want to eat certain foods a certain way? So we kind of help you um, dissolve everything surrounding it and kind of get to the root of the issue um, with that, with these assessments. Okay, a little bit late, but take home points for today is consistency is key. You wanna make sure that you're ready to provide a consistent schedule um, and ready to kind of take on the time when you're looking at these feeding programs. Um, we wanna set clear expectations for you and your child. So having that operational definition of what we are targeting. Be systematic. So it might mean starting small and getting bigger as you go along. Um, 
monitor progress. It's always great. I know taking data is something I find joy, I find joy in, but make sure you monitor the progress. If we're starting out with five ounces a day, make yourself a check mark system of checking the days they have five ounces or, or more. Um, then you can kind of visually see the progress they're making as well as share it with, um, with your team. Um, reinforce good behavior. This is a big, this is a really big one. If something good is happening, make sure you're reinforcing it. Make sure they're getting rewarded. Make sure they are starting to pair all this positivity with the, this feeding. Um, ignore inappropriate behavior. We want to make sure we're not providing a lot of attention when they're engaging in the maladaptive behaviors. Um, keep it up. We want to make, make sure you have a team surrounding you that's going to encourage you. It's hard. Um, have a support system. Have people who can help you. Um, even if you're doing it by yourself, have people, like, make sure you have multiple people trained in it. Um, have grandma come over to learn about it when the BCBA is over. Have have cousins come over and learn about it. Have your have the siblings involved. Um, have that good support system and know when to seek help. Um, know when you need to get a little bit of extra help concerning all of this. Awesome. Okay. Well, this is my my contact information is in the top in the orange with my phone number as well as our clinical supervisor at Trumpet San Diego. Her name is Lauren. Sorry, I can add that. Um, and that is her email as well if you want to reach out to the clinical supervisor. Um, I am going to open the chat if I can figure out how. Okay. And if anyone wants to, um, it's presentation's over now. So if you can feel free to leave, thank you so, so much for coming. Um, it's great to have so many people here and so many people participating uh, and you can, f uh, chat me or unmute yourself and feel it free to ask any questions. Um,